Um, hi, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here today. Um, so um, I am I'm going to talk about a, a design for Unbox Types in OCaml. Before we get any further, though, I just want to say I'm I'm here standing on the shoulders of these giants. Um, I I started at James Street just uh, just a few weeks ago and and have been very actively engaged in this process. But these folks have been engaged in the process for years, um, and and so it is it is thanks to them that that I'm able to to sort of pull all this together today. The other thing that I want to say in terms of context setting is that. Everything that we're going to look at is just a design at this point. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end about about sort of where we are in an implementation. But this the the reason I'm bringing this here is to get feedback, and so I'm looking forward to conversations throughout today and tomorrow about this design. And and this is still sort of very much in early stages, and we're trying to figure out exactly you know sort of some of the, some of the corners to to take. Um, so let's let's start with a motivating example. So I I want to this this is a series that converges to pi. If we add enough of these terms together, we will eventually get well, pi over four. Um, but it takes many, many terms to get there. This is a very slowly converging series. Um, and so I want to write a program um, here that actually uses this, this computation. So I'm going to just walk through this slide uh, uh, fairly slowly. Um, so up at the top, we have a, an estimate type, which is this little record keeping track of the, the current estimate of pi over four, as well as the number of steps that we've taken. That's the count, right? I want to know how many steps does it take to actually converge. Um, it turns out that when you implement this and run this, um, a, a rounding error ends up putting us in sort of um, a, a cycle at the end. So we're only going to compare up to, uh, I guess, you know, um, what was that, 10 to the 9 a sixth. So that's this EQ function to do that comparison. Um, I have a step function which moves us one further along. It makes our estimate slightly better uh, based on which term of the sequence that I'm in. And so this implements that, that alternating, we have alternating signs and then this increasing denominator in our series. Um, and then last, the, the, um, the estimate value at the bottom, that's just a fixed point calculation, right? We, we keep going until the next estimate is close enough to the previous estimate and then we stop. Otherwise, we just keep iterating. Um, so, so first off, one, one interesting result that I got out of this is that when you run this program, the count is quite interesting. Um, it is exactly 500,000, um, which I just, that doesn't really matter for the talk, but I found that very interesting that it's sort of this nice round number here when you run this program. Um, but, but there's a problem with this implementation, and that is that this go, this should really be a tight loop. Note, note that the, at, at the end there, we have else go. Um, that's a that's a tail recursive call, right? This should just be a tight loop. Yet every time we call step, we do a bunch of allocation. So one place that we do allocation is right here. When we create the new record, um, that creates uh, that has to, to allocate um, some memory. Even when we just do floating point addition, we have to allocate some memory. And actually, as we're computing the new term, we have a lot more allocation, right? This does a lot of work. Um, of, of allocating little boxes in memory. So specifically, we can look at the memory and it's gonna look something like this. We have um, an estimate, at EST, this is the, the, um, the local variable inside of Go. It's going to point to this record, uh, a block in memory, which has, which has a little header field. It has the estimate field and it has the count. I guess that C should really say count. Um, and, and then the estimate is gonna be a pointer to another block in memory that stores the actual floating point value. Um, so why do this? We, 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 we lose a lot of efficiency by doing this because we have to allocate all of this memory. Um, so instead of doing that, let's just unbox. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at another version of this program where it's unboxed. Um, so we see here everything that's changed from the previous slide is highlighted in orange. Um, so up at the top, I've now, I've now actually improved this in two separate ways from the previous slide. And we could choose one way or choose the other way or choose both ways. So the first way is that I've made an unboxed record. That's that first hash mark in the type definition for est. Um, second, I've unboxed the float, and that's the hash mark in front of the float. These are two independent optimizations. Um, in the equality comparison uh, function e EQ, now instead of opening float, I have a hypothetical new module float U. Um, maybe it will be longer in real life, but not on a slide. Um, that then imports these operations from a module that works over unboxed floats uh, because hash float is a different type than float. 
Um, in my step function, I now have to pattern match on this record. And pattern matching is now going to require another hash mark to say that I'm opening up an unboxed record. Um, there's a design choice there. We don't actually need that hash mark. We could probably get away without it. Um, so we could talk about whether that's a good idea or not. Um, of course, all of my computation in here in my new term is going to have to use operations from the unboxed um, uh, from unboxed floats. But my literals also have to be unboxed floats. So that's the hash mark in front of the literals there. Um, and then we see that there's hash marks sort of littered throughout. I think I've, I've now demonstrated all the different places that we've seen, right? So we also need to label literals because it's a new type. But we can see here my stack is much simpler. I just have the floating point right there in line in my stack. I have no record. I have no, uh, no floating point block. So, so that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's what we have to do. Hooray. Oh, sorry. I missed a few transitions here. Um, there we go. Hooray. Um, but not all is, is well. So, uh, so let's look at this example here. Um, I have a square root function that works over these unboxed floats and a polymorphic function uh, twice that just takes some function f and applies it twice to an argument x. And now I want to compute twice of square root of, of 16. Um, as I'm running this, um, I'm going to end up with a, um, an activation record for twice on my call stack. And it's going to have f, which is some pointer to a function. I'm not going to worry so much about that right now. And x, which is an inline unboxed float. So that's why it's written right there in the stack. So our friendly garbage collector comes along and, and tries to figure out, you know, maybe it's now time to, to collect some garbage. And takes a look at that 16 that's sitting on the stack. And, you know, that bottom bit of that 16 is going to be zero. So, gee, that kind of looks like a pointer. Um, but of course, if the garbage collector follows the pointer and tries to see what memory that points to, the garbage collector crashes, right? This is, this is really bad. We can't do this. Um, and, and the reason for that is that throughout OCaml, um, we have a uniform representation where every different variable is, is, a, is a value. And by here, by, by, by value here, I really mean that it has this uniform representation where either it's a pointer ending in zero or is an int with that bottom bit set to one so that the garbage collector knows not to try to to collect it. But, a, but an unbox float doesn't meet this specification. And, and so polymorphism over these unbox floats must be stopped. So the way that we're going to do that is by assigning types kinds. Um, except actually kinds are over general. We don't really need a full kind system for this. So, so instead, we're going to say that types will have layouts. Um, and this is just sort of the, a, a subspace of, of kinds that, that classify sort of the types that, that we have in OCaml. Um, so this is this is not a fresh idea. This is based on, on on some previous work that I've done with collaborators, but but there's there's other work out there also in this space. Um, so we have let's if we look at this this example here. Um, well, now the change from the last version is that now we see that the alpha type variable has layout value. Um, it turns out that we don't actually need to write that in our code. We're going to infer that. The old version of, of twice works just fine, but I want to be explicit here in the slide. But now, when I try to call twice on square root and, and, and 16 here, we're going to get a layout mismatch, right? I can't instantiate my alpha variable to hash float because hash float is not a value. Um, so let's look at what at, at exactly sort of what this space of layouts is. Oh, yeah, of course, the garbage collector is now saved, is now very, very happy um, because, we, because he, he doesn't have to look at uh, problematic float value. Um, so all existing types in OCaml have this layout value, um, but but actually some also have a layout of immediate, right? So the way that that I think of this is is that a value is something that the garbage collector must look at, right? If the garbage collector skips out looking at any value, then then we might have a memory leak. An immediate, this this includes int, and then if we have a foreign pointer with the bottom bit tagged, for example. Um, so the garbage collector can look at these things. It's not going to, to crash if it looks at these things. But if it doesn't look at these things, that's okay too. Um, so so that's a, that's a sublayout of value. So we're going to have a sublayout relation so that something a function expecting a type of layout value can also get something of layout immediate. That will be that will be just fine. Um, but then we're going to have a new layout, float layout, and that's going to include this hash float type that we've seen a lot of. Um, there's going to be a super layout, any layout, that's the, the top of our lattice here. 
um, with restrictions that we can't actually compile code if there's a variable whose type has any layout because we don't know how to compile that code. We don't know how much memory it takes. We don't know how the garbage collector should should react to it. So this is um, something that's in our system. There's a few places where it gets used. Um, I, I guess I can answer questions about those restrictions, um, but if this is we're not going to have concrete types of layout, any layout. But then we have more. Um, so we're going to have a tuple layout to allow for unboxed records. So we saw in my big example about convergence to pi that there was a, a hash sign in front of an open brace. So the layout of that is going to be a float layout combined with an immediate, right, for that, that int. Um, so we need to have some layout to represent that. Um, and then we have more. So bits here is something that's word-sized, but something that the garbage collector cannot look at. Right? We don't know anything about whether that bottom bit is going to be tagged to stop the garbage collector from looking at it. Um, and then we can have layouts of other sizes too, not just word size. So if we have a bunch of bits 32s, we can pack them more densely into a structure. Um, and, and we have a few more. So there's, there's other sizes, not just 32, um, and, and we're sort of looking at, at other places to go from here. Um, Andreas. So, um, so float layout uh, on a machine that uses, oh, right, thank you. So the question is how is, is, um, is bits different than float layout or bit 64 is different than float layout? Um, uh, some machines use different registers for storing floating point values than, than for other values. So we want to be able to distinguish them. Um, so one, one question here, um, actually that we have, I said that, that, that I want some feedback. So one open question is, should immediate also be a sub layout of bits? Right from a from a sort of in a formal sense, this works. Right, bits is something that takes up a word that the garbage collector can't look at, um, and that works for immediate also. So adding this extra sub layout link that complicates type inference a little bit. Um, uh, I think we can do it, but it, it would be a little harder. Um, do we want this, or, or or we don't need this for any backward compatibility? But you know, it's an open question for for me. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we can infer layouts. So let's think a little bit about layout inference. So this is an area where, where the design is still being worked out a little bit. So I can promise there will be inference, right? We're not, you're not gonna have to annotate every type variable with value, for example. Um, so one open question about layout inference is where exactly to do it? So uh, let's assume these definitions. So I have a type T whose argument alpha is, has to be of layout bits 32. And then I have a function F who, who's, who can specialize uh, to a, a type of layout bits 32. And so here are some examples to consider. So over there on the left, um, now I have a unification variable alpha. Um, if we look at the fact that we're calling F on Z here, then we see that alpha also has to have a layout of bits 32. That's the only way that this checks out. Um, should we infer that? I think that we should um, because we, we can. It's not very hard to do. Um, moving on to X2, now this is a slightly different scenario. Here, instead of a unification variable, we have a universal variable alpha. So there's a, there's a great opportunity. We have a binding site for alpha. Maybe the programmer should just say what the layout should be there. Should we infer that one? Right now our design is leaning against inferring this one, saying this is a rigid variable, so the, the programmer should state rigidly what its layout should be. Um, going even further, we have this X3. Right Now we have a type declaration, and we have a, a variable alpha here. Now, because alpha is used as an argument to T, once again, this must have layout bits 32. But do we want to infer that, or do we want to require the programmer to write it in? Again, right now, we're thinking of requiring an annotation here. And lastly, we have a, a, a module signature all, all the way on the right. Now, again, I think on a technical level, it is possible to infer that X4 should have layout bits 32. But now we're going sort of quite far. Do we really want to go this far? Um, and so, so this is all really an open question. Um, and so again, while I want feedback from the community on what would be good. We have, a, we, have, we have room to decide here, do we want more inference, which means sort of fewer annotations, or do we want more explicitness, which means things are a little bit more obvious and, and maybe easier to control and predict? I don't know. Um, so just sort of going through um, a, a little bit more of the features that we've, we've designed out here. Um, one, one thing that we want is for uh, unbox types to be widely available. So if I have some code base already with some widget descriptor, which has a bunch of fields in it, 
Um, I've already built that type. I already have a bunch of functions that operate on that type. But maybe there's some function that I want to be able to work over an unboxed version of this type. Um, so by just putting a hash mark in front of the name, now we can do that. So, so a good way to think about this is not that hash is an operator here, but really that when we make a type declaration for a widget desk, we're actually declaring two different types. We're declaring one that's boxed and one that's unboxed, um, and, and that there's a hash mark that, that says which one we want to choose. So in fact, earlier there was a hash mark in front of record construction, um, and the reason for that was to disambiguate between this widget desk and hash wid widget desk without, ne without needing uh, a type annotation. So the nice thing here is that you get all of your old types that you've declared, or at least your unboxed, your, your records for now, um, but now you can use them unboxed. So this makes the feature easier to use and easier to use incrementally. Um, but maybe you have an unbox type and you need to pass it to a polymorphic function. So we, we saw earlier that you couldn't do that. Um, so we also provide a box type as well as box and unbox functions that allow us to go back and forth. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, um, so these are built in. You, you, th these are all highly magical. Better to think of them as families of, defi of definitions rather than single definitions. Happy to take more questions about them. But we get an, a nice equality relating the boxed version with the original declaration. Um, so there's a little bit more that we've done as, dem as described on this slide, some that we have a pretty good design for, some that's still open. Um, we have an implementation, there is a, a proof of concept implementation uh, from a few years ago that's based on OCaml, it was, it was 4.12, no, 4.11 I think it was. Um, so we're, and now we're looking at starting uh, sort of a proper implementation that we hope to merge. Um, so thanks very much for your attention, happy to take questions.